Edgeworks Nebula. Hello, and welcome to Settle the Stars, Episode 2, Interstellar, a 2014 epic science fiction film co-written, directed, and produced by Christopher Nolan. Hey folks, this is Lacey Hannon. Back when our understanding of black holes was little more than a mathematical twinkle in Einstein's eye, who could possibly have imagined there exists in our universe forces millions, even billions of times the mass of our sun that savagely consume everything in their vicinity, even light? English astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington resisted the very idea of black holes, saying, I think there should be a law of nature to prevent a star from behaving in this absurd way. How very English. Nevertheless, the combined theorizing of Albert Einstein, Carl Schwarzschild, and Subramanian Chandrasekhar would eventually lead to our first discovery of a black hole in 1971, further fanning the flames of speculation as to just what these sitting Roombas in space are capable of. While scientists worked on the answers, purveyors of science fiction did not wait to dream up ways these thrilling phenomena could antagonize or otherwise complicate the lives of future space travelers. The 1970s British TV series Space 1999 incorporated a black hole as a kind of maelstrom to be dodged as one would on the sea, while Disney was quick to develop their own 1979 space adventure, The Black Hole. Others, like novelist Joe Haldeman with his 1974 military epic, The Forever War, imagined black holes to be gateways to wormholes that could transport humanity to far reaches of the universe. What, after all, could make for better storytelling than a magical door in space that opens onto worlds unknown? While the science in some of the paperbacks proved pretty well researched, sci-fi films have notoriously cast science to the wind and would typically portray black holes as massive, swirling, and hugely cinematic moths in space with nary a thought as to what the equations would have to say about it. It was not until 2014 that audiences were first shown a realistic visualization of a black hole in a major motion picture. Those visuals came courtesy of the efforts of Christopher Nolan, who sought to bring viewers the most authentically realized sci-fi film he could in Interstellar. Interstellar actually began life as a directing vehicle for Steven Spielberg. The project was brought to him by Caltech physicist and Nobel laureate Kip Thorne, who had spent the better part of his career studying gravitational waves and theoretical implications of black holes, and who now wanted to channel his research into a film. When Spielberg's company DreamWorks ended their relationship with Paramount Pictures, who owned the rights to the project, Spielberg had to give up his director's seat. But the position at least went to a friend of his in the industry, Christopher Nolan, who had recently honed his big budget directing chops on the Dark Knight trilogy and the massively successful sci-fi mind warp Inception. In addition to being familiar with the genre and having a knack for beautifully weaving together intricate storylines, Nolan brought a great deal of personal passion to the project. He had been fascinated by space himself since he saw 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars at the age of seven and Carl Sagan's show Cosmos not long after that. Though the finished film is undeniably imprinted with Nolan's signature style, it's easy to see where the Spielberg influence comes in. At its heart, Interstellar is the story of a widowed father who must leave his 10-year-old daughter to embark on a journey across the stars in hope of finding a new home for humanity. Though set against the cold and vast backdrop of space, the story is ultimately a very intimate and a very human one. It all comes down to a father's love for his daughter and his battle against time and physics for the chance to see her again. While some might claim the real star of the picture is the spectacular IMAX shot photography, the stunning visual effects, or the gorgeous piano and organ-driven score by Hans Zimmer, you'll find Matthew McConaughey delivering one of his career best performances here. And he's joined by a strong cast that includes Anne Hathaway, Jessica Chastain, and Michael Caine. Interstellar imagines a not so distant future where the earth has been ravaged both by dust, storms, and widespread famine brought on by a blight that's progressively wiping out the most important crops. All that remains of NASA is a team of underground scientists still avidly working towards getting humanity off the planet. While the rest of the population has foregone looking to space for answers, 
and instead encourages the upcoming generation to become farmers so that they can work on the problem of producing food. Former NASA pilot turned farmer Cooper is taken to the secret last bastion of NASA. The team reveals to Cooper that a wormhole had mysteriously appeared near Saturn some 48 years earlier, connecting our solar system to one light years away that has a supermassive black hole at its center and multiple potentially habitable worlds. One manned missions were sent to scout each of these worlds and send back a thumbs up or thumbs down. Now the team wants Cooper to pilot a mission that will follow up on the most promising of those planets. A mission that might ensure the survival of his daughter and everyone else on Earth, but at the cost of leaving her behind. Nolan knew that the story would only hold up as well as at science. He dove into meetings with Kip Thorne, who was serving as executive producer, to discuss directions the story could go in and how the science could support everything he wanted to do with the film. Nolan agreed from the beginning that they would only include those ideas which the science supported. He would bring his story concepts and his what-ifs, and Thorne would explain how it was all theoretically possible or not. At one point, Nolan wanted to include a character traveling at the speed of light, and it took Thorne two weeks to talk him out of the idea, explaining that it simply was not possible. Now, before we dive deeper into this film, I do want to say this movie did get a lot of mixed reviews on the plot and the paradoxes created by the use of time loops to tell the story. The internet can sort out any follow-up questions you may have about those if you can't get a hold of Nolan himself. So, to the internet with you. Let's get back to the science. All this back and forth with Thorne ultimately resulted in a film with a pretty sound premise. Nolan also screened Philip Kaufman's 1983 astronaut picture, The Right Stuff, so that it could serve as a model for the crew to work from. And he drew upon features of the International Space Station, NASA's Endeavour shuttle, and the work of SpaceX to help inform the designs of interstellar spacecraft. The uniquely shaped endurance that transports Cooper and the crew to Saturn and beyond was imagined to have been launched in pieces and built in orbit like the ISS. And the reason behind its constant spinning was so it could generate the artificial gravity needed on board. Nolan wanted all of the designs to be founded in function and just a step evolved from where we are currently. The idea behind everything that went into the film was authenticity. Upon release, Interstellar was met by a variety of responses, from those praising the film's adherence to real-world physics to those quick to call out purported scientific inaccuracies. Perhaps it is a testament to the film's devotion to authenticity that any number of reviewers strove to find holes in the fabric of its physics. But Kip Thorne stands by what they accomplished and even published a book, The Science of Interstellar, elaborating on how the physics supported the storytelling. Let's take a look now at the thought that went into crafting that story and how it all bears out on screen. To begin with, the blight that destroys the world's crops in the film, forcing humanity off the planet in the first place, is not altogether outside the realm of possibility. Not that everyone needs to suddenly start hoarding and freezing bread loaves, but researchers have found that increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, like those we are currently experiencing, could aid in the spread of the barley yellow dwarf virus, which is a disease that targets wheat and cereal crops. So cherish your next bowl of frosted flakes because it might be your last. Okay, no, no. But seriously, the kind of dystopian scenario found in Interstellar would likely be a very long ways off from now. And the good news, there are active measures being taken in parts of the world to combat global warming. So the need for us to start planet hopping may not be as imminent as Interstellar proposes. More to the Kip Thorne side of things, the first great leap of science within the film occurs when the crew of the Endurance approach and enter a wormhole located near Saturn. As mentioned earlier, it's not difficult to see why science fiction is so enamored with the idea of wormholes. They're basically the outer space equivalents of those spark-flinging portals Doctor Strange is able to open up and walk through in the Marvel film so he can join the Avengers for dinner in New York and be back in Tibet in time for his 7 p.m. meditation. In other words, they're pretty awesome. They're also pretty improbable, at least in terms of how science fiction likes to use them. Einstein and Nathan Rosen, yes, they of the famed Einstein-Rosen Bridge, theorized that if wormholes do exist, they would be subatomic in size and would last fractions of a second before closing. Definitely not the kind of thing you could pilot a spacecraft through. And believe us, we take no glee in shattering dreams to the contrary. What's more, Kip Thorne writes in The Science of Interstellar 
that we see no objects in our universe that could become wormholes as they age, further quashing the possibility that such things might occur naturally. Thorne hasn't ruled out the possibility, however, that a traversable wormhole could be artificially created, and that is just what we see happen in Interstellar. Thorne suggests it would take a great deal of negative mass to hold a wormhole open for a sustained length of time. Now, it's surprisingly hard to create negative mass. Try berating your furniture sometime, and it'll just sit there, totally unfazed. I'll wait for the crickets to pass. While negative mass is a concept we can understand in theory, scientists have yet to actually produce it. Though a team at Washington State University did manage to generate properties akin to negative mass within rubidium atoms in 2017. For storytelling purposes, Nolan decided a mysterious they, who possessed knowledge greater than ours, would have placed the wormhole there to help humanity escape our galaxy in our hour of need. If a wormhole can theoretically be created, then hey, theoretically, beings far more advanced than us could create one, right? Visually, the entrance to the wormhole in Interstellar appears as a kind of dark crystal ball floating in space and reflecting light from the universe surrounding it, which evidently is what a real wormhole would theoretically look like. In his book, Thorne concedes that while informed by simulations with his equations, the interior of their wormhole was altered significantly to add artistic freshness. Nevertheless, it's hard to fault the sheer visual splendor of the Endurance's journey through all that aesthetically refracted starlight in the film. These visuals were achieved by the Double Negative Visual Effects Company, whom Nolan had previously worked with on his three Batman films and Inception. They also brought to life the supermassive black hole the team finds on the opposite end of the wormhole, the visual achievement of which has been lauded as the most accurate depiction of a black hole in cinema history. In fact, it was not until 2019, five years after Interstellar's release, that the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration was able to capture the first actual image of a black hole. And the similarities between Interstellar's so dubbed Gargantua and the real deal are remarkable. By nature, a black hole offers nothing of itself for a viewer to observe. However, one could observe the accretion disk spinning along its border a ring comprised of gases and various space detritus that's heated and propelled along by the black hole's gravitational influence. Rather than appearing as a single flat ring as one might suspect, the image of the accretion disk is warped by the black hole's insane gravity, so that the far side appears to form a hood over the top and the underside appears to form a loop around the bottom, resulting in the very unusual yet nearly perfectly accurate shape assumed by Gargantua in the film. Thorne admits they opted to forgo a certain Doppler effect where the intensity of the disk's brightness would dim the further away it is from you, but a little artistic license like that is easy to accept when you consider no other black hole in movie history has come close to the accuracy of Interstellar's. The role Gargantua serves within its system is also pretty different from how most people think of black holes and their behavior. Rather than orbiting a star as we do our sun, the three potentially habitable worlds considered by the crew of the Endurance orbit the black hole itself. When you think about it, there's no reason why planets shouldn't be able to orbit black holes as they do stars. After all, an object's orbit is simply a matter of its being held along a circular trajectory by the gravity of a greater object. The first of the three planets visited by the team turns out to be nothing more than one vast, world-spanning ocean. Knee-deep, but for its gigantic waves that soar 4,000 feet high and which make for one of the more jaw-dropping visual effects in a film that's full of them. Thorne explains this effect to be possible because the planet has an elongated football shape and has recently become tidally locked with Gargantua, meaning a single face of the planet is always positioned towards the black hole it's orbiting, as is the case for the moon with the sun. As a result, the majority of the world's water has become amassed at opposite ends of the planet. It sounds like a very particular situation for a planet to be in, and Nolan probably just told Thorne, I want a 4,000 foot tall wave in wading water. How can we make this possible? But it's still very cool that the physics check out. As equally astounding as the physics behind its shallow water monster waves is the fact that due to an effect known as time dilation, an hour on this ocean planet is equivalent to seven years passing on Earth. 
meaning a trip to its surface would prove very costly for the crew who still hoped to reconnect with loved ones back home. The time dilation experienced on this planet results from the massive amount of gravity exerted by Gargantua. The greater the gravity, the more slowly time moves. In order to account for this rather extreme scenario, which Nolan declared a non-negotiable, Thorne realized the planet would have to be as close to Gargantua as it could be without falling in, and the black hole itself would have to be spinning as fast as it could within the laws of physics. Again, these are all very particular circumstances, but Thorne crunched the numbers and Nolan got his scenario of one hour on this ocean planet, equaling seven years outside the reach of its gravity. As Thorne notes in his book, to make a great film, a superb filmmaker often pushes things to the extreme. While definitely extreme, the circumstances surrounding Interstellar's improbable ocean planet nevertheless fall within the realm of what is possible. Toward the end of the film, the story transcends the boundaries of known science when McConaughey's Cooper sacrificially descends into Gargantua so that his sole remaining crewmate can be slingshot by the black hole's gravity in the direction of the one other potentially habitable planet that they have yet to visit. The slingshotting part is perfectly feasible. The maneuver also features in The Martian and was used in real life by the Apollo 13 crew to swing around the moon and accelerate back to Earth. But whereas an astronaut descending into a black hole should expect to be fatally spaghettified, to use the proper scientific term for it, no, really, that is the proper scientific term for it, Cooper finds himself gently floating between a multitude of bookshelves that open onto his daughter's childhood bedroom. He is in an interdimensional construct that Nolan describes as the Tesseract. It is a place built specifically for Cooper by the same they who designed the wormhole, and it is where he is able to send a message back through time so that his daughter can be the savior of those who remain on their dying Earth. None of this, of course, has any basis in known physics, and that's because the Tesseract was designed by beings with an understanding of science far beyond what we know. That's where the physicist takes his leave and the visionary director takes over. Nolan's goal from the beginning was to inspire a new generation to look to the stars, just as the works of Kubrick, Lucas, and Sagan had inspired him. He also wanted to present an optimistic outlook on the future of space exploration and the notion of where humanity could one day find themselves. After the film's release, Nolan told BBC News, we hope that by dramatizing science and making it something that could be entertaining, we might inspire some of the astronauts of tomorrow. While Thorne added, films such as Interstellar or Contact or 2001 A Space Odyssey are inspirations for young people. A number of people I trained as a physicist with got involved with science because of movies like these. Beyond hopefully inspiring the next generation of astrophysicists, Interstellar has already contributed to the way scientists are now visually simulating space. Following their work on the film, chief members of the double negative visual effects crew led a colloquium at CERN and wrote and published two research papers in collaboration with Thorne on the science that went into creating the film's revolutionary visuals of space phenomena. While the science may have helped Nolan successfully tell the story of his space opus, Interstellar in turn is already helping change how we are applying science to space. If you're enjoying the show and want to rewatch any sci-fi we will be covering, Check out our show notes where we have the following week's topics available. Next week, we will be diving into Contact, the 1997 film based on the novel by Carl Sagan. In the meantime, be sure to leave a review and tell your friends about Settle the Stars. Every review really helps for an indie show like ours. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Settle the Stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform. And we're also mirroring our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. And be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworksentertainment. The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible. And I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. Thank you all for listening. I hope to see you again soon. And as always, happy terraforming. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula. Hey, Molly. Hey, Max. Do you know how bats can see in the dark? I don't know how bats can see in the dark. Do you know how hot it gets on Venus? I have no idea. Do you know how rockets go to space? No. 
But do you know how the moon was formed? No idea. Well, if you're curious about these things just like we are, tune in to our new show, The Scientific Melody, with Molly and Max every single Thursday, wherever you absorb your podcasts. And if you have a hard time remembering things just like us, we'll turn everything into a song for you. Our first episode is out February 24th. It's the Scientific Melody. It's the Scientific Melody. Nebula.